it's always nice uh, as i told you to look at your own work i'm not necessarily saying what work you've done now what work you may do in the future i remember you know around uh, 1999 uh you know we our lab, a lab in uh, bhavnagar had uh, made a, a, a anti tubercular extract you know uh, from uh, from a halophyte a salt loving uh, plant in in between 1999 and 2005 uh, that was probably the biggest lead in india you know uh, in the discovery of a new anti tubercular it was outstanding okay? and uh, you know exactly like these people had done uh, you know we started doing uh, fractionating okay and we we wanted to uh, really get to the active constituent you know so we kept on you know separating out things and seeing that yes the activity is increasing so we knew that we are going in the right direction that we are enriching okay uh, and at one point you know we got uh, an active which was about 32 or 32 nano nanogram per uh, kilogram of body weight you know uh, that kind of an activity okay? and this activity measurements were being done by another laboratory the central drug research institute you know so uh, and it was really wonderful okay? i i remember i and a, my colleague who discovered this jb pandya uh, we actually you know i said hey mr pandya uh, uh, you know because it is from a salt loving plant you know can we just taste it and see what it tastes like i mean of course i don't think we suspected that it will be uh, toxic it was not the right thing to do you know and we tasted it and it tasted sweet like sugar okay? and uh, uh, you know every analysis that we did okay showed that the uh, molecule is uh, is just like a sugar okay? uh, and uh, but then sugar Does not have anti-tubercular activity. Not the sugar that we know. Okay, the glucose, fructose, uh, uh, sucrose. You know, uh, you know, all these patents were uh, granted. Uh, it must be that there is a different uh, conformation of a sugar uh, which was formed by the plant, which we were never able to separate out from the actual sugar. You know? It was very frustrating. You know, for over about five to seven uh, years. You know. and so i i can see the pain of not being able to uh, actually separate out something is very frustrating but at some point you know uh, that uh, han had the guts uh, to say that no uh, enough is enough we have formed barrier you know uh, that's remarkable okay. okay now let me ask you the question you started with uranium uh, you uh, uh fired a neutron at it okay and out of that something came and they basically you know got able to identify positively uh, the form not positively circumstantially <laughs> that it must be barium okay now let me ask you another question that uh, 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 what uh, what would be you know uh i i mean i was just thinking uh, that uh, uh what other questions or unanswered uh, things uh can come to your mind at this stage is there anything else just take yourself back to the time when uh, uh, when uh, han and all concluded that it is barium okay is there any other thing which might come to your mind that oh we could have also done this so uh, so there could be one like i have a one question in this so yeah so since the uranium formed barium so what about the remaining mass so that oh my goodness you have answered the question i never expected that you'll answer it so fast so what happened the question right yes sir absolutely brilliant question and uh, 
and that the rest of my lecture is all about that of course mary curie had uh, uh, found a way of separating out um, uh, radium from uh, barium you know all that is fine but exactly as you said okay i mean and with all this work that they have done for years you have seen how painfully they did things did i did someone not ask this question what is happening to the remaining mass okay and of course they did okay but they did it a lot later you know they could have done it earlier maybe they would have uh, avoided a lot of these uh, uh, problems you know uh, which uh, which they encounter okay? so uh, that's a great great question now so uh, you know in other words uh, you must ask yourself uh, have i exhausted uh, all degrees of uh, freedom and uh, th that's the issue the question that you have asked actually opens up another degree of freedom you know? and uh, so what this what, now let, let's ask you the question okay so since you uh, you said what happens to the other mass uh, tell me what mass would you suspect here's your uranium so okay? so uranium would be 235 right you well no now wait a second Let, let's not talk about atomic uh, weight okay best is that you stick to atomic number okay number okay. right because you neutron is also there's no change in atomic number okay huh. so it's much better that you stick to atomic number you no know, and ask yourself okay so what happens just see so so uh... all of you can try 92 minus 56 oh yes sir 56 sir krypton sir which one krypton krypton what's the property of krypton property like i mean it is an inert gas it is a gas right it's a yes, gas sir. yes it? sir and you know why am i always so obsessed with the solid it's the far more difficult to resolve because so many things can form and uh, so whereas you know if someone okay had said that hey uh, you know let me uh, uh, look at okay uh, why, why don't i just analyze the gas phase and see if something is coming up okay and uh, it would have been a lot easier don't you think Sir, but no one had expected itself that a gas would be formed. So. No, but if I, look, you are a chemical engineer. Okay, I mean, if what have you all been taught? All you have, you have been taught is energy balance and mass balance. Yes, yes. Okay, and I would include dark balance. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, you you look at it. I mean, I have to balance the charge, right? Correct or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you know what I'm saying is, these are the lessons I want you to learn. I don't want you to know the details of whether you made succinate and uh, chloride and sulfate and this that. That's not the intention. That is only to show you the rigor with which they analyze, okay? and also to show you that. always ask yourself that could i fly out into another dimension because maybe then i can solve my problem easier and always ask yourself this question have i exhausted all degrees of freedom you know that's what i thought to myself and especially if i had done a simple subtraction and i knew that krypton would be worth having a look at okay so what he says is in the first communication on these tests which were in opposition to all the phenomena observed up to the present in nuclear physics january 6 1939 the indicator test mentioned had not been entirely completed and we had therefore expressed ourselves cautiously 
as a second partner in the new process we assumed an element with an atomic weight of about 100 as in that case the atomic weight would be that of uranium now that's foolish you no know? i mean i don't know why he's talking about atomic weight you ought to be talking about atomic number that would have been also something maybe you know because uh, uh, of this beta radiation all these complications uh, maybe uh, he thought that atomic weight is a, a better way to go okay that's all right you know of course knowing that atomic weight is important as we'll find out okay after the completion of the measurements in hand and of the cycle the possibility of error was still further excluded this completion of the test and the above mentioned cycle appeared in a second communication february 10 1939 okay look january 6 1939 february 10 1939 one month just about and you know is very fashionable today for i find a lot of people saying hey you don't know how fast things are moving today okay? you're moving at lightning speed it's not like the past what nonsense i mean in my opinion these people move much faster uh this also described the splitting of the element thorium okay so then they started doing some work with thorium instead of uranium and its confirmation with the aid of indicator test analogous to those described above here also reference was made to the detection of an inert gas and an alkali metal derived from it okay and uh, the nature of the gas was recognized and its separation from uranium accomplished by means of a current of air passed over the uranium during the irradiation process an active strontium and an active yttrium were identified in the uranium let's forget about all this that's not important okay but obviously uh, then they uh, started looking at uh, the companion uh, uh, product you know and uh, you know that would have been a much much simpler uh, experiment for uh, for them to do you know? so that's what they uh, did okay? now then something interesting happened uh, but before i come to that okay uh, maybe i will uh, 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 just uh, mention a couple of things okay one was and i'll pass on this paper to you okay the paper by uh, meitner and frisch in nature where for the first time they used the word fission and drawing on uh, basically cell fission why did they talk about is a cell fission because a fission does not give you uh, like when a cell divides it gives you two uh, uh, parts you know which are more or less similar in size they are not so di different in size that one is a speck and the other is a, a massive you know you don't have that you know cell divides to give you uh, uh, two cells which are roughly of the same size okay and uh, so knowing you know that one of them had become barium and the other one is also okay you know roughly of a similar size so it looks more like uh, a cell division and therefore uh, uh, fission okay immediately after the first publication on the production of barium from uranium there appeared as a first communication an article by lise meitner and or prish in which the possibility of a breakdown of heavy atomic nuclei into two lighter ones with total charges equal to that of the original nucleus was explained with the aid of bohr's model of the original nucleus now bohr had basically proposed a model you know in which he viewed the nucleus as if it's a liquid you know and uh, he also talked about certain conditions you know that when for example the nuclear charge becomes very high the surface tension uh, will become vanishingly small and with the result that i can increase the surface area you know and uh, ultimately it will just break apart you know into two two drops you know and i'll just uh, uh, pass on the uh, paper of uh, meitner and frisch you know but that was bohr's uh, model bohr did not only uh, work on uh, uh, the uh, 
the atomic structure of uh, of how the electrons are uh, there in a in an atom you know uh, but he actually did a lot of work on on the nucleus okay and uh, and uh, meitner and frisch uh, also then proposed you know that uh, when these things like two positive charges you know uh, if if like let's say they're splitting okay and forming two separate entities you know that at what kind of a velocity you know uh, these things will uh, fly out from each other uh, because of the repulsive force that is created okay and uh, you know it's very very interesting uh, that they came to a number uh, which is what you would probably get from uh, e is equal to mc squared you know uh, but they actually use classical understanding you know in uh, in deriving some of the energies okay so people knew uh, that there is a potential to release vast amounts of energy you know uh, through this uh, uh, splitting uh, because of the massive amount of uh, uh, nuclear repulsion you know uh, okay and uh, you know it was uh, that was interesting the great repulsive energy of the fragments produced by the splitting was first demonstrated experimentally by frisch and shortly afterwards by joliet meitner and frisch soon proved that the active breakdown products previously considered to be transuraniums were in fact not transuraniums but fragments produced by splitting okay so so that's the kind of uh, all that work took place literally within uh, a couple of months okay this is the paper that i will uh, send across to you i was reading it yesterday uh, carefully you know and you will see uh, that they talk about uh, a kinetic energy of the order of 200 uh, million electron volts you know uh, and uh, and basically it's calculated from nuclear radius and nuclear uh, charge and uh, how the repulsions will uh, put them out and you can also see uh, that you know they put this fission within inverted commas because this is the first time uh, that this word was being uh, used you know and uh, so it's quite interesting okay uh, this uh, uh, paper uh, you'll see it as a very qualitative looking paper i'm sure there's a lot of computation that go goes in and you know it talks about the concept of surface tension uh, was proposed by bohr this is bohr's paper okay and uh, and basically how you know that uh, uh, the surface tension of nuclei uh, decreases with increasing nuclear charge and may become zero for atomic numbers of the order of 100 you know and so that's the reason uh, why uh, uh, why these uh, nuclei can uh, uh, behave like a liquid which can uh, basically get flattened out you know and ultimately uh, split okay so uh, that's what uh, uh, he did now the the charge issue is now very clear okay <clears throat> han says does the process proceed in such a way that the nucleus of the uranium with a charge of 92 is split into two nuclei of moderate size okay and uh, if one of these is barium uh, which has a nuclear charge of 56 then the other one must be 36 okay together it will add up to 92 now let me ask you another question <clears throat> okay we have been able to balance out the charge and uh, and you know that could have told people that it is krypton what is the next big question that will come to your mind i've got barium so think about uranium uranium the bulk of it is uranium 238 okay and uh, uh, now yeah, i've got uh, uh, a neutron uh, which is coming in and uh, it's fragmenting into barium and uh, uh, and uh, krypton what will be the next question that i will ask so the mass is add up yes yeah. correct so does the do the masses add up and for the masses to add up i must know what are all the isotopes of barium that are known and what are all the isotopes of krypton that are known okay. and if i take even the heaviest of the isotopes that are known of barium and krypton okay and i add it up and do i see 
uh, a, a proper mark balance? That was the next question. Okay, so that's what he's saying. Uh, 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 both have, however, as may easily be seen from the masses of uranium and of the stable isotopes of barium and krypton, which occur naturally, too great a mark. I mean, you know, there was no substance of barium and uh, uh, krypton that were known that can compensate for the entire mass. If, if we, at that time, you know, they thought it is uranium-238. Uh, we'll come to that later. And plus, I'm adding one neutron. So 239. You know? And so uh, what's going to happen to, uh, uh, to the masses? Okay, They should, therefore, pass over into stable elements with higher nuclear charges with emission of beta rays. And in fact, our last experiment showed sometimes achieve stability by way of a great number of unstable intermediate. Day. Let's not uh, worry about this. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now he's talking about uh, uh, masses. The highest stable krypton isotope has a mass of 86. In uranium fission, there is produced among other atoms an unstable krypton with mass 88. You know, that also they had found you know, when they were uh, Frisch and uh, others were doing this, Joliet Curie, uh, they were doing all this work. Uranium-235. Now, by that time, um, you know, Bohr, based on the, uh, his analysis of the magic numbers of uh, uh, the nucleus, you know, had basically said, that look, uranium has uranium-238 and 235. It cannot be uranium-238 is far too stable. You know? And uh, it cannot be the one uh, which is interacting with the neutron. You know? And it must be uranium-235. You know? so, uh, so that had already been proposed by Bohr. So what they had to co consider now was uh, uranium-235 with an atomic mass of 235 uh, plus one neutron coming in 236 okay and then they said look the highest krypton which we have identified the isotope is 88 so 236 minus 88 is 148 okay but when they analyzed you know all the isotopes of barium the one that was known you know the stable, the most stable barium isotope was had a mass of 138. You know? And which, so in other words, there was 10 neutrons, uh, which was in excess. Okay, So uh, that's what he says. As the highest stable barium isotope has a mass of 138, the first mentioned product is not less than 10 units heavier. You know? that's, that's what it, you would conclude. And then Strassman and myself had already noted in our second communication the possibility that neutrons were set free in the fission process. That this was in fact the case was first experimentally determined by Joliet, you know, Joliet of chemical engineering uh, fame. Okay. Now, so, and then he, in his Nobel lecture, he lists out, you know, uh, stable, uh, uh, the various isotopes, you know, and uh, basically says that, uh, uh, you know, up to 138 was known, 130, 132, these are of uh, barium, okay, and, uh, okay, they found something which is unstable, 88, okay, but uh, uh, it still didn't add up, you know, uh, it would have to have 148, you know, for barium, okay, which, which just wasn't the case, you know, so at that time, uh, people realize that neutrons are being set free. The moment that was figured out, you know, uh, 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 a totally different uh, uh, thing happened, okay, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people then started asking, uh, what is this neutron doing? You know, if it is set out, set free, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, I'll read out what, uh, what they say. From the nature of the problem, the physical work proceeded in a different direction. Especially important in this connection 
was the above mentioned investigation of jollier in which he proved experimentally in the spring of 1939 that in the fission process neutrons appeared in addition to the always two new elements since by the action of neutrons and uranium fresh neutrons are liberated the latter if they meet uranium atoms produce further fission in their turn that's what you would expect right i mean i'm injecting yes. a neutron it is releasing more neutrons you know and those neutrons then can go and interact with more number of uraniums okay and uh, so basically the concept you know of a chain reaction uh, of obviously came into play if more than one fresh neutron is produced and the process is so arranged that all the fresh neutrons strike uranium atoms then we have a chain of continuously renewing fission reactions which like an avalanche started by a snowball can attain enormous dimension you know it's such a beautiful description that is given in the nobel lecture okay thereby the practical application of atomic energy first came into the range of possibility s fluge then attached to the kaiser wilhelm institute for chemistry was the first to refer to this you know that this possibility of a chain reaction okay now in fact you know what is also remarkable you know when uh, uh, when you read this okay nobel lecture uh, you know uh, we we talked about jolliot okay jolliot curie uh, iron curie's uh, husband and the uh, chemical engineer okay and jolliot curie got the nobel prize okay in uh, i think in 1934 uh, as we said for uh, his work on artificial radioactivity and look at jolliot curie's imagination you know and we are talking about uh, 1934 well before the discovery of nuclear fission okay and the vast amounts of energy etc uh, that uh, is possible to release you know uh, but in his lecture you know, he is look at his anticipation and look what he says About ten years ago, Jolliot concluded his Nobel lecture with the following words: "If turning to the past, we cast a glance at the progress achieved by science at an ever-increasing pace, we are entitled to think that scientists, building up or shattering elements at will, will be able to bring about transmutations of an explosive nature through chemical chain reactions." if such transmutations do succeed in spreading in matter the enormous liberation of usable energy can be imagined but unfortunately if the contagion spreads to all the elements of our planet the consequences of unloosing such a cataclysm can only be viewed with apprehension astronomers sometimes observe that a star of medium magnitude increases suddenly in size a star invisible to the naked eye may become very brilliant and visible without any telescope the appearance of a nova this sudden flaring up of the star is perhaps due to transmutations of an explosive character like those which our wandering imagination is perceiving now a process that the investigators will no doubt attempt to realize while taking we hope the necessary precautions in other words you know his discovery of artificial radioactivity uh, brought him to uh, to speculate you know on a much much larger thing that is how was the universe formed how are the stars you know suddenly becoming brighter you know all of this uh, basically came into the realm of imagination and then this is what uh, uh, han says what was 10 years ago only a figment of our wandering imagination has already become to some extent a threatening reality the energy of nuclear physical reactions has been given into 
men's hands, read human's hands. Shall it be used for the assistance of free scientific thought, for social improvement and the betterment of the living condition of mankind? Or will it be misused to destroy what mankind has built up in thousands of years? The answer must be given without hesitation and undoubtedly the scientists of the world will strive towards the first alternative. That is how to do good with nuclear fission and not do bad. No. Now, you know, what was interesting was that the first part of his Nobel lecture was written for uh, when, uh, you know, he was supposed to get the Nobel Prize in 1944. Okay? But as I told you, he was captured by the Allied uh, forces and he could never deliver his uh, Nobel lecture. And he was ultimately invited, you know, in 1946 to deliver his lecture. Okay. So, and by that time, uh, the United States uh, had already bombed Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. So he uh, took that opportunity to write a postscript, you know, on the, on what exactly uh, happened, and also put in better perspective, uh, you know, some of the work that he had uh, uh, done. You know, and so he says in the preceding paragraphs we have given a general outline of how the investigation of the natural radioactivity of uranium led to the artificial splitting of that element. But this does not exhaust the possibilities of uranium. Uranium consists mainly of two isotopes with atomic weights 235 and 238. The first is present in the mixture only to the extent of 1 over 140 part, 0.7%, you know, roughly. Nevertheless, the fission process described above which is caused with special violence by slow neutrons is to be ascribed chiefly to its rare isotope. It has already been mentioned above that Lise Meitner and the present writer were able to identify after the irradiation of uranium with neutrons, a substance having a half-life of 23 minutes as undoubtedly a uranium isotope. Okay? And then, you know, by that time, what they found is that the very short half-life product are the ones actually which are uh, basically the ones that are causing uh, fission. They are not long-lived isotopes. The 23-minute uranium was produced in a so-called resonance process by neutrons of a certain velocity. Since this substance emits beta rays, a representative of element 93, that is an actual transuranium, must be produced. So it is not that what Fermi had speculated was wrong. But it turned out that the, the reaction of, uh, of uranium with neutrons was far more complex. And the entire complexity arose because of varying neutron velocities. It was the neutron velocity which caused you know, so much of confusion okay? and also led to so many other uh, things that subsequently uh, happened. Although we sought for it, we were unable to detect it in the very weak preparations which we had at the time. Later, it was identified in the United States as a beta emitter with a half-life of 2.3 days. Okay? Thus, it has an atomic weight of 239. You know? So, the 23-minute element, you know, which they talked about, you know, uh, was uh, uh, essentially a uh, uh, a uranium isotope, you know, which had a half-life, you know, of that, okay, and then uh, uh, it was also a, a beta emitter, you know, that's what he's talking about. Okay, now, and then let us also uh, look at uh, uh, what were some of the uh, other possibilities, okay. Uh, as in process one, slow thermal neutrons mainly attack the rare isotope. Uranium-235. Process three. Now, what I'll do is that before that, let me go into this chart okay, and tell you why all of this created so much confusion. This is natural radioactivity of Becquerel. Right? So if you take, for example, Uranium-238 or Uranium-235, you know, 
it will progressively undergo sequential alpha beta uh, uh, releases okay and it will form radium and ultimately it will form lead if you take uranium 235 it goes into protactinium then into actinium then into lead these are the natural pathways which had already been uh, deciphered okay what was found with neutron okay, is that and this is the very short life you know uh, things that uh, uh, han is talking about that uranium 235 with a neutron breaks up into a barium and a krypton okay and uh, uh, and uh, effectively releases uh, three neutrons okay and i'll tell you what happens to the rest of the neutrons okay and 200 million electron volts which was really initially computed by meitner now what you must also know is that you know depending on the velocity people have been able to identify something like uh, 25 elements so it's a very very complex thing you know it's not just as simple as barium and krypton okay it, it's far more complex than that you know? what they subsequently also found and all of this process is happening with the slow neutrons okay what they also found is that when you are releasing neutrons in the process okay those neutrons are actually going and striking the uranium 238 which is in much higher abundance okay uranium 238 but uranium 238 is far more stable but it does pass on to uranium 239 you know the isotope and that emits beta radiation forms neptunium okay 93 and it emits another beta radiation plutonium okay and finally then it releases an alpha particle and it crosses over to uranium 235 so you can make uranium 235 from uranium 238 you know through this process okay but this is a very very long lived isotope you know so this actually will never work you know uh, this is you you really not get substantial amounts of uranium 235 that way you know now what then was realized was also that you see, because this is a deactivation pathway, that the neutrons can go and strike the uranium, which is present in large excess. You know? So I have to view the uranium 238 as an impurity. And if my objective is to make a weapon, you know, then obviously I will try and separate out the uranium 238. That's what I'll do. Okay. So, so, you know, uh, that is the work subsequently which uh, became uh, the Manhattan Project, you know, uh, and it was conceived by the British. Uh, it was known as the MOD uh, Project, you know, and largely done in the US, you know. But the British has kept a lot of things secret, you know, they had figured out a lot of things, okay. And uh, this is the one, you know, what they realized is that if this happens, then I'll release large numbers of neutrons you know and my chain reaction will become explosive and uh, so you know uh, all of that work everything that you know about gas centrifuge you know iran being blamed for uh, actually enriching uranium and uh, there are uh, strictures on uh, iran it's all related to uh, really of trying to enrich the uranium 235 so that you can inhibit or suppress to the maximum extent uh, this particular reaction with otherwise gobbles up neutral this when they succeeded in doing uh, and they could enrich the uranium 235 okay by removal of uranium 238 uh, they had uh, made the uh, ingredient for the bomb uh, this is what was uh, detonated in uh, hiroshima and it was known as the little boy okay now what they also realized you see at that time was that if you can use the uranium 238 and carry out these decays up to plutonium 239 you know, this was very very long lived you know? so their interest was in plutonium 239 okay? 
what they found is that plutonium 239 can be reacting with the neutron and it too undergoes fission and it will form xenon and zirconia. So the other pathway, uh, which was envisaged for the bomb, okay, was really plutonium, okay, and uh, uh, so uh, this particular bomb that was detonated in Nagasaki uh, was the it was given the name of Fat Man. Okay, that is uh, 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 the plutonium uh, uh, fissure. Now, what they also were able to do in a very very secretive uh, way in University of Chicago, you know, and it was done by Fermi, who had moved over from Italy to to the United States, you know, and uh, Fermi uh, is the one who developed uh, this process of converting uranium into plutonium, you know, uh, so that they could make the plutonium based uh, bombs, you know, and uh, uh, finally, of course, uh, they also figured out there's a third process, okay, and the third process is that sometimes there can be neutrons which are extremely high velocity, okay, and uh, so, you know, uh, they can uh, follow a distribution of uh, velocities, the neutrons, you know, uh, so I can always get a, a typical uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann kind of a, a distribution, you know, uh, that kind of a distribution in uh, the velocities of, uh, uh, of neutrons, okay. And that this is another process that they figured out that uranium-238, it gets struck by one neutron, but two neutrons come out, you know. So uh, that then gets converted, you know, into uh, uranium-237, okay, and uranium-237 uh, will uh, uh, basically then uh, get converted into neptunium and finally into protactinium, you know. So uh, it's it's all because of the varying velocities uh, of, the, of the neutron, okay. Uh, now, let me also tell you that this is so important, knowing the, uh, what is the role of the, of the neutron, uh, that, for example, the Canadians, you know, have a nuclear reactor for energy power generation, okay, which is based on heavy water. And what heavy water does is that it can slow down the neutrons, okay, which are being released. Okay? And because of that, they are able to sustain a chain reaction without enriching uranium in uranium-235. And it's known as the CANDU reactor, the Canadian uh, Canadian deuterium uh, reactor. You know, and one of the reasons why in India we have the heavy water board, you know, uh, because heavy water is extremely important in all of this nuclear uh, power generation. Okay, so let me just now go back, you know, to this. As in process one, slow thermal neutrons mainly attack the rare isotope uranium-235. Process three, process three is this one, is a, is a kind of competitor of process one. Since in the resonance process three, the neutrons are captured before they have reached thermal velocities. It is a matter of experimental technique to prevent this capture as much as possible in order to facilitate the chain reaction. On the other hand, the extra neutrons produced in the fission of process two give rise to the resonance process and thereby to the formation of plutonium. If this latter element is obtained in sufficient quantity by means of a slow controlled chain reaction carried out on a large scale okay, in a so-called pile and is separated from uranium, then it can also act as carrier of a chain reaction. Now, why this was so important was that whereas you can imagine uh, how difficult it is to separate two isotopes, you know, to separate uranium-235 from uranium-238 is very complex. You, know? you require these huge gas centrifuges to, to do that, you know. Whereas, you know, when I do, when I convert uranium into plutonium, and let's say I've made, say, 5% of uh, plutonium, Plutonium and uranium are separate elements. So to separate out the unwanted 
uranium from that is simple. So I could easily enrich plutonium, you know, through very, very classical chemical methods of separating plutonium from uranium. So that's why there was so much of interest in plutonium to sustain the chain uh, reaction. Okay. And, uh, you know, he of course painfully says that both uranium-235 and plutonium are made in the United States. The result was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, I can well imagine the pain that he uh, he felt, you know, uh, that uh, uh, that he created something uh, which was uh, first used in such a destructive way. Uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, I had the uh, rare privilege of uh, being the laboratory assistant for uh, Walter Kausman in Princeton. Okay, and uh, you know, I, in in fact, the freshman lectures used to be delivered by the best lecturers. And Walter Kausman was one of the most brilliant uh, uh, lecturers in uh, in Princeton. He was the one uh, who uh, made the detonators uh, for the uh, little boy and fat man. You know, I didn't even know that at the time. You know? uh, but uh, uh, you can go and look up Walter Kausman, you'll find uh, that the he led the team, uh, you know, we, who made the detonators. So I don't know whether to feel proud of him or uh, or uh, unhappy with him okay he's no more of course uh, but uh, uh, you know that, that that was it i mean and there were thousands of these people the most brilliant people you know who all got into this destructive mode of making the the bomb okay uh, so uh, i hope and then uh, he uh, uh, basically you know lists out uh, all the various uh, uh, processes which i have uh, described over here, you know, you can go through them one by uh, one, you know, that what are all the various uh, processes that he is uh, talking about. Okay. Uh, is, I mean, you don't have to be 100% clear about everything. I don't think it's also necessary. You know? uh, but uh, have you more or less got the gist uh, of what was the sequence of events, you know, uh, leading up to actual practical realization of uh, the uh, the atom bomb yes sir. Uh, by the way uh, the plutonium fission is actually uh, fairly complex uh, that you can uh, uh, you know roughly about uh, uh, 73 percent you know uh, goes through uh, uh, this kind of a, a process where it forms uh, xenon and zirconium, you know, and about 27% uh, it goes into uh, uh, through this kind of a process where it ends up uh, actually forming the isotope of uh, plutonium, you know, you don't actually get uh, a fission. You know? So, uh, so this is also uh, very important for, uh, for you. To remember. Yeah, sir, uh, one, uh, one doubt I had, sir. Uh, yeah. Like when we were going through the uh, the whole process so there was some mention of thorium as well yeah so that is how they discovered so then like after that the, uh, no one was working on thorium or like oh, no 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 in fact you know uh, uh, i must tell you that uh, there's a huge amount of work going on in thorium uh, both in uh, in india and china okay and the reason why india has uh, not for nuclear weapons, uh, but for nuclear power generation. Okay? Uh, and the reason for that is that whereas uh, India does not have any significant resource of uranium, you know, uh, India is, uh, I think it is the second or third largest in the world uh, in terms of thorium reserves. You know? So uh, uh, in India, you know, uh, there is... Uh, huge amount of interest in uh, in thorium okay but thorium unlike uranium you know uh, in fact i remember one of the previous directors of uh, brc had called it like a wet wood you know it means that thorium per se is not fissile you know it has to be converted into a a, a fissile uh, uh, element okay in a fissile form and then only it will undergo the chain reaction now, you know, uh, this is another thing that I thought I will uh, mention to you. Uh, just imagine uh, the atom bomb 
was exploded in uh, when 1944 i think um, i'm not sure about the date uh, and uh, here we are talking about han uh, having and, and the other people more or less identifying the whole concept of nuclear fission you know around two, uh, 1939 okay we are talking about what five years i mean five years is the time that it takes for someone to do a phd and in five years to go from a new a completely new concept to the detonation of the bomb okay we're just talking about five years so you know i hope you can understand the massive intensity with which work was being carried out today if you are talking about sustainable development this that you will have to work with that kind of an intensity and not thousands of people doing thousands of things maybe thousands of people doing only two things then you will be able to achieve the kinds of goals that we have to work towards you know for the future okay? now what is very interesting is that you know we are talking about uh, 1945 when uh, the bomb had already been uh, detonated <coughs> and look the first nuclear power plant okay, uh, was built in 1954 10 years after the explosion of the atom bomb okay. so peaceful use actually came much much later okay peaceful use of uh, uh, nuclear energy but it is not that people were not speculating about it you know this is a very uh, famous uh, uh, quote you know uh, from this person glenn seaborg you know who actually was the one who uh, discovered uh, neptunium and uh, plutonium okay and uh, what seaborg says is very interesting and very futuristic in august 1945 the first widely distributed account of nuclear energy in the form of the pocket book the atomic age discussed the peaceful future uses of nuclear energy and depicted a future where fossil fuels would go unused i think that in reality what will happen is that maybe it will be nuclear fusion rather than fission you know uh, but look people were already at that time envisaging a age free of fossil fuels which would be nuclear power 1945 and this is what glenn seaborg uh, says there will be nuclear powered earth to moon shuttles nuclear powered artificial hearts okay and uh, you know he goes on to speculate let me tell you today there are aeroplanes which are being designed for the future which will run on nuclear power sounds i know very futuristic okay but actually people are doing that Okay, uh, there, there are people who are uh, making all kinds of or proposing all kinds of nuclear uh, devices. You, you look at this, for example, all these nuclear submarines. And look, this one says E is equal to MC squared, you know. Uh, this is the USS Enterprise, you know. This is the first nuclear powered aircraft carrier, you know, 1964, okay, which traveled 50,000 kilometers okay without refueling so it tells you uh, what is the possibility obviously if i can run a uh, submarine on nuclear power i mean okay i mean there are difficulties but why can i not envisage that uh, an aeroplane uh, will run with nuclear power and uh, so you know i hope you can uh, see the endless uh, uh, possibilities okay. now let me also tell you so that and uh, that uh, like if we are trying to use nuclear power for aeroplanes then that will also like reduce 
the weight of fuel oh, that we need to that burn. That is precisely the point. You know, I, in fact, let me tell you that the in in an let's say suppose you know today you have those uh, uh, planes which fly non-stop from uh, let's say Mumbai to uh, uh, to uh, uh, New Jersey. Okay, all right. Uh, and uh, so those are what it's about a 13 hour flight without any refueling and so in in which case all the fuel which i require has to be carried in the plane at the time of refueling in mumbai the the weight of the fuel is actually much more than the mass of all the passengers plus their luggage put together and imagine if I can reduce that, you know, to something like a, a, a tenth or hundred of the size. You know, but then you will require such unbelievable safety features you know, uh, that uh, those safety features will add a lot of weight. You know. So like in a nuclear reactor, the core reactor is a tiny thing, a small thing. But you go and see a nuclear power plant and see how big it is. It's all because of the safety features. And the same safety features are going to be true uh, even in an airplane or wherever. Yes. All right. So, uh, and, and that's where, you know, uh, you all, uh, as chemical technologists and engineers, uh, you all must be uh, able to realize the totality of a solution not a single component of part of a solution and uh, so you know those are the issues now let me also tell you that because ever since there was these uh, uh, you know the uh, the uh, some of the uh, big uh, accidents you know like chernobyl and uh, three mile island okay and uh, uh, so i uh, what has happened is uh, that uh, uh, people have uh, like Germany. Germany has a policy uh, of not building any more nuclear power plants. Okay. India actually uh, uh, actually decided, you know, uh, that uh, we must have uh, much more of nuclear power, you know, because in India, uh, I, I mean, we you, the situation is we don't have any fossil fuel. I'm not even talking about climate change. I'm talking about the reality, you know, of the raw material not being there, the feedstock is not there. We import about 82% of all our crude oil. Okay. So, uh, you, you know, so uh, uh, there's a serious uh, problem. Okay. And, uh, but then what is holding up a lot of this is really safety concerns. Safety concerns and also the fact that, you know, to build a nuclear power plant, it takes a long, long time. And there are many issues. I was looking at, you know, why it takes a long time to cure some of these cement structures. It takes a long time. You know? And uh, so uh, there are all round, you know, uh, work that is being looked at uh, to make. Uh, uh, and again, nuclear power plants means people always think that it has to generate, you know, uh, huge amounts of uh, uh, power. People are looking at small nuclear power plants. Maybe you can put it underground, tiny plants. And maybe uh, it'll be just enough for uh, some communities, you know, maybe about, uh, say, 200,000 people. And I have uh, uh, tiny nuclear power plants. Uh, maybe they will be safer. And uh, just to show you that I'm not talking uh, uh, things which are all fiction. The U.S. Department of Energy, okay, they have a challenge, uh, and it is known as the Meitner Challenge. Let me just see one second. In case I'm not sure, because you know I'd I'd seen this a uh, a bit earlier. I just want to see whether it still exists. This challenge. Is there it looks like. <laughs> Look, Meitner, Modeling Enhanced Innovations 
trailblazing nuclear energy reinvigoration. And they named it after, of course, it's an acronym, uh, but you can imagine that it was named after Lise Meitner. Okay. And uh, now anyone can go and apply for projects. Okay. And if you have a, a great idea, you know, and you can look at it, you know, open 2021. Okay. So have a look. Okay. Maybe some of you will come up with good ideas, you know, who knows? Okay. And so let's just see what this says. Nuclear power provides about one fifth of US electricity generation, delivering reliable, low em emission base load power to the grid. These plants are all conventional light water reactors, not heavy water, mind you. Okay. And that's why you need an enrichment of the, of the fuel, uh, light water reactors. The technology of which has evolved steadily over time. As utilities have begun retiring older plants, however, Comparatively high costs have made it difficult to justify building new nuclear power plants. The low volume of new plant construction combined with expected retirements of existing plants is projected to reduce US nuclear electricity capacity by 20.8 gigawatt by 2050. For nuclear energy to contribute in the coming decades, the next generation of nuclear reactor plants need to simultaneously achieve walk away safe and secure operation, extremely low construction capital costs, and dramatically shorter construction and commissioning time than currently available plants. Okay, so you can see, all right, that someone has thrown open a challenge to attain these goals new innovative enabling technologies for advanced reactor design are needed. The development of these enabling technologies requires an understanding of the interrelatedness of design choices. Thus, Meitner encourages a rethinking of how pieces of the nuclear reactor system fit together when developing the technologies that will make these plants viable. In the building phase, cost savings may be realized through modular and advanced manufacturing techniques that bring most of the work to the factory instead of to the construction site. Not very different, you know, from the uh, way today all the flyovers are constructed, right? I mean, everything is being uh, just assembled in the uh, in that place. Okay, you don't actually uh, all the uh, the pieces of the flyover are being brought from a factory. So they're talking about uh, something similar. Technologies that could reduce operational expenses, including robotics, sophisticated sensing, model-based fault detection, and secure networks to enable substantially autonomous controls, as well as a high degree of passive de safety. Nobody, uh, you know, in a... Uh, in a nuclear power plant will do anything other than passive safety. No? Okay, I hope you know that there are other forms of design of uh, safety like uh, active safety and uh, things like that. And uh, But passive safety is what is always considered to be uh, costlier, you know, and uh, it's like uh, if I'm, uh, uh, I'm carrying out a high pressure reaction and I expect that uh, you know, there might be a pressure buildup, you know, then obviously I will build up, you know, my, uh, uh, or design my reactor so that it can tolerate that pressure, you know, rather than to say, you know, that I will have, uh, 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 you know, interlinks and feedback control and this, that, uh, so that such a thing will never happen in the first place. You know, nobody is going to do that in a nuclear power plant. Okay? You will have to design for passive safety. Okay. So, uh, but I hope you can understand uh, that there are exciting uh, uh, challenges, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and the story is not over. And let me also tell you uh, that uh, do not ever think okay, that uh, the story of uh, nuclear uh, uh, power is a story of the past. 
uh, as the fossil fuel problem gets more and more serious, I am not even talking about climate change. I am just talking about you know feedstock availability, not to speak of climate change. And uh, you know uh, you will have uh, a situation in your hand. Today there is no solution. You cannot just bank on solar and uh, uh, and wind. And and uh, you know even if you do, uh, you know to to actually prepare the solar cells etc. The amount of energy that you require to make a solar module, where is that energy going to come from? Is going to come from fossil fuels or nuclear power or something? So the initial investment in energy is very large. Whether it's a wind turbine or whether it's a, a solar plant, people forget that. That's why you have to do a complete analysis, okay? and uh, and really uh, then see you know what is practical and viable and and what is not. Okay? Uh, but anyway, I hope you have got the gist of uh, uh, nuclear fission and how the entire uh, uh, discovery happened. Any questions from anyone? Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, there is one problem also associated with nuclear energy, that is the generation of nuclear waste. Of Absolutely plutonium. right. See, those are the big issues. Why do you think nuclear fusion you know, is being talked about so much? Because in nuclear fusion, you know, your waste problem is a is a is is a relatively trivial problem. If you want again a good, interesting problem to work on. You know, you can actually, people are trying to recover uh, uh, nuclear fuel, you know, from the spent feedstock okay, after it's uh, done its job. There's a huge amount of work going on in that, in how to uh, 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 deal with that. And so those are going to be all the inventions of the future uh, to uh, manage the problem of nuclear waste. Let me also tell you from a nuclear feedstock point of view, uh, uranium point of view. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, but uh, maybe I've told you all this in the past, uh, but all the phosphate fertilizers which we are using in our country are contaminated with uranium. If you can recover all of that uranium from our uh, phosphate fertilizers, you can meet the entire uranium requirement of India. Those would be the problems of sustainability to work on. Okay, and uh, so you know, I mean, look at it in all its dimension. Okay, obviously the nature of the uh, problems and the solutions today are are different, you know. But draw inspiration from the uh, work that I have described to you: how people think, how people solve problems. Okay, and that's how you must identify problems today, which are problems for the future. Okay. All clear? Yes, sir. Yes.